June 25, 1876, Custer offered little explanation of his plans. Events unfolded too quickly for the appearance of a decision-making process that followed democratic rules. Nonetheless, Major Marcus Reno, the next in command, was certainly under the impression that Custer and his troops would offer him some relief. However, Reno did not see the events that took place two miles north of his location. So he and his fellow officers later claimed that Custer had abandoned them or was gone to get reinforcements. Either way, they were abandoned. It's known that the Gray Horse Company under Captain George Yates made at least the appearance of an attempt to cross the river and strike the village. Captain Miles Keough and his company were held in reserve while also serving as a southerly rear skirmish guard. Lieutenant Calhoun's troopers performed a rear guard action between Keough's and Custer's positions. Meanwhile, Custer took about 50 men a quarter of a mile further north to a shallow place in the river that was later named Ford D. It's believed that he was hoping to secure some of the non-combatants. Sure enough, across the river from Custer were fleeing women, children, and old people. The women and children were not alone, though. Warriors were among them, and they were shooting at the troopers while slowly making their way across the ford. Nonetheless, Custer and his men stayed in that area for more than just a few minutes. It's been speculated by others that they were waiting on reinforcements. When no help arrived and the hordes of warriors defending the women and children and the old people had crossed the river and were close enough to make their repeating rifle shots, single shot rifles too, and stinging arrows find both horse and trooper, Custer and his immediate command fell back to what has become known as Last Stand Hill. When Calhoun and Keogh's troopers dismounted to form skirmish lines, their mounts were scared off or were shot. The warriors advanced toward the troopers by crouching down in the ravines. When they were close enough, they fired arrows into the air toward the horses. The flying projectiles rained down on troopers and their mounts. Since most of Calhoun's and Keogh's troopers were now on foot, retreating was not a viable option for them. Like Custer's immediate command, desperate troopers sought the high ground of what's today called Last Stand Hill. The high ground couldn't save Custer and about 40 other troopers who fought to the death there. Custer was killed by two bullets and his ears were mutilated. Other bodies were mutilated so badly that a positive identification could not be made. Although a number of military horses were captured by warriors, only one horse on Last Stand Hill was saved from the carnage by the military. His name was Comanche, the trusted mount of Captain Keogh. If you're ever in Lawrence, Kansas, on the University of Kansas's uh, campus, you can see Comanche. He's mounted and on display there. As it turned out, Custer's perceived threat to non-combatants, women, children, and old folks, distracted the warriors who repelled Reno into the woods and then across the river and up the bluffs, where they came to a somewhat defensible position on the saucer-shaped hill. The warriors' distraction lasted long enough for Benteen's three companies and Captain McDougall's pack mules to catch up and hunker down next to an obviously overwhelmed and probably inebriated Major Reno. You may recall that there were some disagreements among troopers gathered around Reno and Benteen at the defense site. The sounds of rifle fire to the north were heard by some and not others. Captain Weir, who claimed that he heard the volleys and random shots, rode off with his company in that direction. Perhaps feeling a little bit shamed by uh, Weir's departure, Benteen and Reno reluctantly followed with their troopers and even the, the injured. From a peak about a mile north of the saucer-shaped defense position, Weir and Benteen stopped their mounts and looked through field glasses to the north in the direction of the shooting. About two miles ahead, they could see blue-coated riders shooting toward the ground. Without field glasses, Weir thought that he could see mounted soldiers, but they weren't troopers. The riders were warriors dressed in cavalry jackets, and the men they took the jackets from were lying on the ground dead or dying from their wounds. 
At this point, Captains Weir and Benteen noticed that the Pony Riders had shifted their direction and were making a concerted effort to reach their position. Benteen strongly suggested to his colleagues that they fall back to the saucer-shaped hill. He argued that the saucer-shaped hill was much more defensible. No one seriously challenged his argument. As the troopers made their way back to the defense site that now carries Reno's and Benteen's names, Lieutenant Godfrey's company performed a rear guard action. Popular culture does not tell much of the next part of the story of Little Bighorn, nor does it talk about the nearly 48 hours in which the 7th Cavalry went on to hold back a native force never before seen or encountered in North America. Most of the survivors claimed that it was Captain Frederick Benteen's cool demeanor and leadership that helped them to live to see the massive tribal movement which Sergeant Charles Wendolph described as being like the children of Israel's exodus southward toward the Wolf Mountains. Warriors later stated that they lifted their siege of the troopers on the hill because hundreds and perhaps thousands more troopers were spotted coming in from the north. In the end, the warriors were just as likely to, to disperse as they were to stay and fight. Their pragmatic decisions to fight were based on the probability of success. They saw no shame in waiting to fight another day when the odds were in their favor. Nope. The exodus was nearly over at 7 p.m. on Monday, which was about 55 hours after the first shots of the Battle of Little Bighorn were fired, and 10 days after General Crook left the field at the Rosebud, General Terry and Colonel Gibbon had finally arrived in the valley. No one dressed in blue or buckskin survived Last End Hill. So no one knows for sure the decisions that were made by Custer after trumpeter John Martin was sent back to hurry up Benteen. Custer's native scouts stayed longer than Martin. Nevertheless, they were dismissed before hostilities began. What's known about the last stand, a name given to the fight by the natives themselves, is derived from the location of the bodies and later archaeological finds, as well as testimonies given by warriors. If you're interested in reading more about how the 102 troopers and scouts survived during those 55 hours, check out I Fought with Custer by Charles Wendolph. He was the last of the 402 survivors to pass away. He died on March 11, 1950. You might note that he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for risking his life to scamper down the bluff to retrieve water from the river for, for the wounded and the rest of the troopers. I also recommend the Godfrey Diary, which was written by Lieutenant Edward Godfrey. General Alfred Terry's diary was also published, but it doesn't shed much light on the events that transpired between June 22nd and the 27th. I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Nathaniel Philbrick, who wrote The Last Stand. It reads like a novel. In that regard, it reminds me of Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. Well, I hope you got something out of these short videos on Custer and the Little Bighorn. Keep on learning, God bless you, and I'll see you next time here on The Vantage Point. Bye-bye.